still? Oh. Uh, there I go. <laughs> Hello everyone. I guess the speech in the other room just ended. And thank you all for joining us, even though it's really sunny outside today in Gothenburg. So yeah, we might cut this talk a bit short. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> We're going to use a full hour. You're going to have to be here for <laughs> So. Uh, today I'm going to talk to you about the Yocto project and what is my experience with it and why I actually grown to like it this much. So we're going to talk about building embedded Linux systems essentially with the Yocto project. So a little bit about me. Uh, my name is Gordon Markus. I come from Croatia. I've been working with embedded Linux for like eight years now approximately. I'm working for a company called Luxoft here in Gothenburg. Uh, I'm also aiding uh, an open source project, a Yocto based infotainment platform that we're just spinning off a bit uh, as well. So that's how I'm involved in Yocto. And I'm also a member of the Autosar Consortium. Uh, that's a little bit about me. Uh, then I have a few questions for the crowd that stayed here, even though it's sunny outside. <laughs> so, how many of you here have built their own embedded Linux image? Can you raise your hands? Oh, that's, I would say, like 60% of the people here. That's quite nice to see. <laughs> and how many of you here have used the Yocto project? Like almost the same people. So that means there is a small portion of the people who have been building embedded Linux images, but actually without the Yocto project. So we might try to convert you now. <laughs> so I guess now is the time to start the presentation. And I heard there's a lot of people here who are fond of uh, system D, so I guess it's time to actually start the presentation. So, like I mentioned before, the topic of this talk is going to be building embedded Linux systems. So, what are the main goals here? Naturally, we want to have like a custom embedded Linux image built. We want to compile our own applications and include them on that image, as well as those applications. Not necessarily though, because some build systems don't do this. Uh, we want to create integration points for custom software, meaning that if we develop a base platform, we want to have a system that allows us to have the points where other people can develop against this embedded Linux system that we have designed. We also want to be able to test the output binaries and check the ecosystem compatibility. Uh, the last point is if we are good open source troopers, which since we're here at this conference, I guess everybody is, so <laughs> that's quite nice to see. Uh, so basically, which embedded Linux build systems you know from before? Uh, these are kind of like the ones that I want to highlight because I have experience working with these ones from before. So I guess you heard before about the build root, open WRT, uh, PTX this, and of course the Yocto project and open embedded. All of them are quite different, but also quite similar in their own way. And basically how my path with the better Linux systems went, actually building them, went like this. So I first started with the Engstrom, which is essentially not a build system, but it's a distribution. And I hope that my pronunciation was good, even though this is a, <laughs> even though this is a Swedish name and I'm living here for two years, so pardon me everyone. And later on, uh, basically Engstrom is just a distribution. So it's just a pre-built binary that you flash on your ARM target. Uh, later on, I switched to build root because that actually enabled me to build my own custom distribution. And what was really nice with build root that it leverages the technologies that I was aware of before for this build system, meaning make and kconfig. So it was quite easy to get to know it and to build new things with it. Uh, later on, I switched to ptx dist because build root was in my opinion, it was kind of constrained, but I used it back in the day, so right now I don't have a lot of knowledge about it. So I wanted to see how PTX list compares to that, and then I switched to PTX list, which is actually uh, was a really nice experience. But then, uh, when I moved here to Sweden, I started working with the Yocto project, which was approximately two years ago. So, uh, basically my background is in the Yocto only two years now, and I'm going to try to introduce you with the points why I learned to love it, as maybe sometimes even comparing it to the uh, to build root and PTX list, but also uh, highlighting some points about the Octo why I really came to understand why a lot of people why use it and why is the adoption so big. 
So, uh, what is the Yachtel project? I guess the good thing to mention here is that it's a collaboration project. Uh, basically, its main goal is always to create a Linux best system for embedded products and a custom one. And the good point here as well is we want to do it like regardless of the hardware architecture, which pretty much is always the case. Uh, when we're talking about the collaboration project, we want to highlight here that it has its core building blocks and one of those is Open Embedded Core. Essentially Open Embedded was a embedded Linux framework that was started off on its own. But later on the Octo project uh, and the Linux Foundation thought that the Open Embedded mod model of collaborating and actually developing was not any more suitable. They adapted the core part and built it under the umbrella of the Octo project. The other core part is BitBake, which is essentially the parser and the interpreter that uh, manifests the build. And Pokey is the reference platform actually for Yocto. So every single time you start with Yocto, you will start with the Pokey distribution, which is quite nice. So to get more into detail about those building blocks. So what is Open Embedded Core? Like I said before, it evolved from Open Embedded in collaboration with Yocto. And it's essentially right now it's a collaboration of components shared between Open Embedded based systems. And when we're talking about components here, those are layers, recipes and classes. Meaning that it, we're talking about the software components and how they're bundled and logically tied together. So the base part of how we define like a software component inside of the Yocto build system or as a matter of fact, in the open embedded framework is the recipe. As you might see, there's an analogy towards cooking. It's a bit big, then we have recipes, and so there's like also a baker part as well inside of the uh, bit big. So, a Yocto recipe is essentially like a metadata file, comparable to what you would have in, in build root, like a make file, and it also describes the components, dependencies, build, deploy steps, and so on. The main difference here is with ptxdist and buildroot is that it has its own specific syntax. So basically the first time I looked at it, it was a bit puzzling. It introduced a lot of new things that I did not know actually how to approach. Okay, I hope that the visibility is quite nice and even you in the last row were able to look at it. Um, basically, as you might see, there is a lot of information that you need to fill to create your own recipe. Essentially, I divided it into three parts. The first part being the component information, which is basically just metadata for the other people to understand what you're actually writing here. And also uh, license information and revision tagging, if you want to do that. So this part, you could even populate it right now, even without being equated with the Yocto project, because it's something that's quite generic, I would say. Then the second part is the source information, where you essentially put how to fetch the sources, and which revision of that source to use, if it's applicable. For this instance, I'm using a template library project, which is essentially a bare, uh, a bare uh, C, C++ library that is used to exhibit how to actually integrate things with Yocto. Then, uh, the last part, the third part, the build and deploy structures, that is actually where you'll spend the most time learning new things and trying to understand how it actually works. Uh, coming back to build root and the make files, it's much simpler because you already are used to this technology, at least the majority of the people who've been working with open source. When you're acquainted for the first time with the Yocto recipe, a lot of these variables are really perplexing, and I'm not going to go into detail what they really mean. But the nice thing is here is that, as you might see, there is no instructions of actually saying how to build it per se, but there's an inherit flag saying that uh, we're going to inherit CMake. And if it's a CMake project, it's going to be as easy as that. Meaning that if you can run CMake and actually build it that way and afterwards make, it's going to happen. So that's quite nice. So you don't need to define a lot of things on your own. So basically to summarize from this, uh, the recipe is the part where you actually define how to build a single component and deploy it into the system. Inside of the open embedded core, which is like I said, one of the main building blocks, there are recipes that are commonly used to build embedded Linux systems like also BusyBox and also classes and uh, recipes for CMake and AutoConf and other actual build systems. So this is like the, one of the examples, what you can actually find in open embedded core. Uh, then, we, since Yocto has this layered approach, 
uh, we're trying to collect everything like logically in a single place, meaning that certain components has a logical common purpose, then we try to include it in a single layer. And basically the thing with the layers is that you can include a layer, but you don't have to pull everything what's inside it. You just pull the parts that you want to include, but I'm going to explain this later on. And everything that is a layer essentially has a meta prefix. So with Yocto everything is really meta. And the examples of certain layers are like, for instance, the meta cute 5 layer, where you'd expect to find all the cute components. So instead of having it fragmented and having recipes flying all around, you have one meta layer that encompasses the whole uh, Qt5 components, and then depending on the real, you include them into your image or exclude them. The same for meta networking, which is a different example because it's inside of uh, Open Embedded and is essentially networking tooling and dev tools and also um, network managers and so on. Uh, for instance, Meta Intel is an example of a meta layer that is a BSP layer. So it's essentially made for a certain hardware architecture. Then uh, basically you also have, I wrote here, Meta Project Foo, which is essentially what you would do. You would create your own project in your own software stack. You would put it in your own, in your own meta layer. So that would be kind of similar to that. Uh, then we go back to BitBig, which I said before is the build engine, which is like responsible for parsing and interpreting the metadata files, essentially the recipes and the configuration. In the end, it's a task scheduler because it creates the dependencies and it creates a task list uh, depending on the image, meaning which is essentially a list of packages, a list of recipes and the configurations, and it creates an ordered task list after that that needs to be executed. So that's also quite nice with Yocto that uh, you can easily picture the dependency chain afterwards and parallelize the build as much as possible. So then going back to Pokey, is like I mentioned before, is the Yocto reference implementation and a collection of tooling and configuration used to create a new distribution. So when you would start uh, your first Yocto project, you would always refer to Pokey and try to make a spin-off of it and build your own layer and your own software components and integrate it against it. Because that's probably the best way to go instead of getting too deep in the water immediately. Uh, Alright, and then to bundle it all together in one picture, essentially uh, we have the part, like I mentioned before, we have the upstream sources on the top that we're trying to fetch those uh, instructions are found in the meta files that are essentially recipes and configuration files and once all this is bundled and got together the bitbake essentially creates the light blue part which is the build system so it fetches the sources, patches them, configures them and also runs all the steps, creates the analysis and splits the packages and then essentially creates a package stream so that's also one difference from the from build root that essentially build root does not create a package stream it essentially creates the whole root file system immediately while Yocto essentially it creates a package stream which is then used to create the image and the SDK as well so basically you need the host tooling to which is going to be used to actually work with a better target later on So all this is fine and dandy and you probably, you that know about the Octo project, I guess you already knew this before and a lot of you that are new to the Octo project, basically uh, the things that I said right now are really confusing because Octo is really difficult to explain and it is a pot to swallow. It's a really powerful tool to build a bit of Linux systems, but it's really hard to explain, especially in one hour, so I'm not going to try to do that. I just want to come here and say like, okay, why, why do I think it's a cool thing? Why, why do I want to use the Yocto project as compared to the other solutions maybe? And what are the parts that I want to highlight from my personal experience and from the projects that I was involved in? So basically coming back to the meta layers and the layered approach. Basically what they're trying to achieve is a logical separation and aggregation of software components. And also like try to be more agnostic to the top layers as well as the bottom layers when you're developing. Meaning if you're creating a middleware layer, you want to make it compatible with pretty much any hardware and also any users later on that are going to be on the top layer from you. And also that breeds like maintainability and naturally reusability of your components and other open source components. 
So to paint the picture again uh, about the layered approach, uh, basically in the bottom there is always the open embedded layer. Like I mentioned, the base components that are you use to build embedded Linux systems. Then on top of it you have the Yocto layer, basically that is here because you need it for the, uh, the framework actually to work. Then we have the hardware layer, I painted it here like Meta Intel for instance, but it could be also another ARM, ARM platform or NVIDIA and so on, which is essentially ARM. Then we have the UI layer, which can be GTK or Qt for instance. Then we have the commercial layer, and then we have the project layer on top of it. And the idea is here that, as you might see, as a hardware vendor, you would want to have your hardware adopted with all of these projects above you. And essentially, you would try to make your meta layer in a way that it doesn't block others from working on top of it. And as well as if you're working on your project layer, you want to make it that way that the hardware layer is interchangeable. You want to be agnostic to it. Naturally, the project layer sometimes might depend on the UI layer or the commercial layer, but in the end, you want to make it in a way that's, that certain software is reusable and interchangeable. So that's kind of like the main idea behind the layered approach, is the reusability and moving, moving from one software stack to another or from one hardware to another, which certainly is enabled by this kind of approach. Uh, then I want to say a few things about development and debugging. Uh, when I was visiting one of the conferences about embedded Linux development, there was a really small room allocated for like develop, uh, actually debugging tools. And the room was completely full, basically because everybody was really interested, how do I actually debug inside of Linux? What are the tools that we can use and so on? Uh, the good thing about Yocto is that uh, it tries to aggregate and naturally you have this, all of these open source tools in one place. You can really easily find them and you can really easily use them. But what's also really nice is all the added stuff you get with Yocto with just a few variables that you can use to tweak your uh, essentially image, the whole image, or additional artifacts that you can use together with your image. And those are, can be found in the image features uh, variable. Uh, essentially, this, uh, this variable list uh, is something that you set in your configuration and you're configuring your actual distribution. Uh, and here is an example, like what kind of image features you can have. So basically, like I mentioned before, uh, if we look at tools debug, it's quite nice because it would add all the debugging tools that you pretty much expect to have from a Linux system. It would add like, for instance, GDB and S-Trace. If you add tools profile, you would add the profiling tools like Volgrind, Perf, and so on. And even you can include the debug packages on the target itself if you want to, but that might be kind of scary because there's not enough space to have debug symbols for pretty much everything on your target, right? So, because of that, that essentially you want to create, uh, you want to have debug symbols on your embedded target, it's probably not feasible to have it for every single package. And sometimes you really need to go way deep to inspect what is actually going wrong with your system. So from my experience, we had a story when we were developing a system that essentially used a Qt frontend. We were developing um, a graphical user application and we had intermittent crashes and we had no clue what was going on and this was all happening on an embedded target. Essentially, we started deploying one by one debug packages there and essentially looking at the trace, we could easily see, okay, this is where the trace stops to be readable because it's not in this component anymore. And then we start digging deeper and deeper with the debug packages. It, it didn't become feasible anymore because the system ran out of space, we couldn't identify where it actually the stack would lead us, and it became really hard to understand what was happening there. Thankfully, uh, the smart people who developed the Octo project, they have a really nice solution for this. So essentially you can create a debug file system that is remote, that is not on the target itself. But you create the target image and on your build machine you have the remote file system with all the debug symbols. And basically it's easy, just as easy as this. By the, by, you add these two lines and basically you're able to read through the whole stack pretty much, which, is, which was super valuable in the case that we had. And basically you would then use GDB naturally, uh, connect your host to the GDB server on the target, 
point to the debug file system that the Yocta project produced and essentially then you would have the full trace and you were able to actually introspect what happened and also step through the code and so on. And that saved us a lot of time and we actually found like a really deep bug inside of the Qt, uh, actually Qt Quick V4 uh, JavaScript engine, which was something that we would never actually got there if you see that it's on a better target, it's intermittent crashes, nobody knows when it happens, but actually by using this approach it was easily done. So that was quite nice. Then, something about uh, testing. Yocto has the, uh, the concept of test images. So they can be run uh, like either automatically or they can be run manually. And they can also be run on the virtualized, meaning on the on Kimu, or they can be run on the real hardware. And once again, it's really just as easy as including this flag, test image equals one. Uh, what does this mean actually, to have like a test image concept? Essentially, you want to have something in your continuous integration pipeline that you want to test the sanity of your platform before you even start to analyzing crashes on, on certain parts that you're developing. Because it might be that by changing the configuration, you're actually impacting the lower layers and something you're, you're tempering with the hardware and even, let's say, um, DMESIC stop working or SSH stops working or ping, you can't even ping the target because you brought the network down, for instance. So this is something that you would use as a suit to actually test the sanity of your target. And what's really nice is that the author also has a set of predefined unit tests. Like I mentioned, for example, they will test like if they can ping the target. Basically for the real hardware target, there's a lot of instrumentation actually needed to actually connect it and so on. With the virtual target, it's really quite straightforward because it's running on the same machine where BitBake is actually running and executing this the test tasks. Uh, basically, like I mentioned before, ping, SSH, LD message, and so on. It also has the variable that I mentioned here called auto. So there's a lot of uh, open source components that you're going to include that already have predefined tests. And by including this variable, you will actually ensure that all of those tests that are applicable for your image, embedded image, are actually going to be ran. Which is quite nice because uh, for regression testing, like I mentioned before, you will change something, it will change a lot of other things in the stack and one of these auto tests, actually one of those components will become broken because of your changes. And once again, it's as easy as including one line. And adding custom tests is just a matter of following a pattern that is already easily found on other open source components because everybody tries to be compliant with it. And like in the in the background, what's actually happened happening? Uh, it's actually Python, remote Python actually script is SSHing and executing uh, like a test suite that is then developed uh, with the open source component. So basically, your component when you develop it, you need to have a test defined in this way, and then you can easily include it in appended here. And. What's really nice about it, like I said, that the tests are available in the BitBake console because the testing is actually executed from the build system while it's actually ran on the virtualized or the real hardware. So the test results are available in the BitBake console, which makes it really nice and easy to integrate with the CI system. So you can easily parse through the logs. You don't need to actually go to the logs manually on the hardware target or on the actual target <coughs> and then extract and see where did the actual, why did they get an error code and so on. Everything will be actually reported inside of the BitBaker console, which is, um, is, from my experience, I saw a lot of homemade solutions that do this, essentially. They create a remote hardware, they SSH into it, they execute tests, they SSH again, they copy those, and so on. And in Yocto, there was already it was a, there was a need identified, and they had a ready-made solution. They created a ready-made solution for it, essentially. And it's super easy as adding a couple of lines, essentially, to your configuration file. Then, I want to mention something about uh, license compliance. And basically, I guess a lot of us here are quite interested because we are open source developers inside this room. So, uh, the question is how to maintain compliance with various open source licenses during the product's life cycle. Because we want to do our due diligence, we, want, we will have to understand what is actually, what kind of artifacts do we need to deliver with our, by using open source 
what kind of artifacts we need to deliver and what are the implications of using certain software. And essentially the Octo project comes with uh, really nice features for that. Like coming back to the recipe file, uh, there is a mention of these variables like the license and the license file checksum. So uh, basically you would point to a certain, a certain software component that you want to build. And during its lifetime, the author of that component might decide to actually change the license, which is, as it being him like the sole owner, he can do that. And essentially, uh, what then happens is that you might declare the license and you're not aware of this change anymore. And that might be tricky because at some points you might be prone to license trolling, which might not be nice. At some point you might have to pay some royalties and so on. So by that way you declare a license, license variable and you define the file, actual file, and the checksum of that file. So basically by stepping up by revision or by version of the software component, this you will be reported an error, this checksum is no longer valid and you have to revisit it and then you see, okay, this license changed from being uh, MPLv2, it changed to being GPLv3 and then you're like, okay, that's not something that I want really actually. Might be, might not be. But it's a really nice way to actually capture this. As well as uh, the license variable uh, is also quite nice because later on you have like an aggregate of Oh, actually, the, oh, I added this slide as well. <laughs> so this is kind of like a mental exercise about the Qt Web Engine license. That sometimes the open source licenses are easy and straightforward, like in the previous example, which was MPL v2. And then we have the example of the Qt Web Engine license. So as you might see, it's actually, a, it's like a logical equation that you have to solve. <laughs> before you want to actually use the component and what is actually, it comes with a blog post. So even though sometimes uh, the license fields should be nice and short and easy, sometimes they're not. So I, I don't want to encourage you to do something really bad, but I would say that every single time you see like an uh, expression like this, study it as much as possible. Because yeah, sometimes it's not easy, especially in this example where uh, Qt Web Engine actually relies on a lot of other open source components, which are then licensed on their own way, and basically that's what it looks like right now. Uh, and essentially, in the end, by using the license variables, what is the end is like the bill of materials we need to provide as open source developers. Most of the time, it's the source code as well as the license text and the modifications that we have done. Uh, with Yocto, there is always a download directory in which you can introspect and look at all the components that you've actually downloaded and used before modifying them. And basically, you can always ship that. But that's quite an overkill. So you would not usually do that, but you would create a small script that is already readily made available in the Yocto developer's manual that will only extract the sources that are under a certain license that tells you that you have to provide the source code. As well, with the license text, Yocto will aggregate the licenses, the text of the licenses and it will provide you in a separate folder all of this text pretty much. So that way you already have it in one place and you can easily copy it and share it with your users and your customers and so on. Uh, when it comes to modifications, that is also if you're including patches or creating your own changes on your source, you have to do this a bit more explicitly then. So it's not as straightforward as just including the source code that is licensed under a certain version. But it's still, uh, inside of the Octo Developers Manual, they easily explain how do you also ship that. So basically, trying to diffuse all the possible cases that we have here. And there's also another nice feature. Well, honestly, I'm not sure if it's, it's nice or not, because as open source developers, we want to create everything in that way. So we don't want to have certain licenses that we don't agree with, especially when it's like open source licenses. Uh, they have a variable that's called the incompatible licenses, where you can actually blacklist certain licenses that are not that you don't want to use in your product for a certain reason. Uh, and then afterwards, if you do that, naturally you have to manually remove the dependencies on or provide alternatives to the components that are actually required. So just to paint the proper picture, when does this actually happen? It's quite, quite common, especially in the sector that I'm working on, and that is the automotive sector. 
For instance, the GPLv3 licenses um, and software is still a big no-no in certain industries because essentially the goal of these industries is to prevent user modifications on an embedded device. So naturally, then you would have to blacklist those licenses in the following way. Essentially, this is good because if you look at the complexity of your embedded Linux system, you're going to include a lot of things and you'll look at the licenses of the things that you actually included. But you're never going to look at the actual licenses of the dependencies because you don't have time to that to do it manually. So by sending actually the incompatible license flags, the build system will scream at you and say that there's like a dependency towards GPL3 software and I can't build this anymore because there's nothing I can build actually that has this. Like I said, it's something that is being done in certain industries to prevent modification of, yeah, of the embedded device and the software on it, just for saying like the GPL3 software. But you can also put here incompatible license and say commercial, for instance. And that way you would protect yourself from actually including uh, commercial licensed products but basically, then you would not get them that easily, then probably someone else would give it to you. But that way you know that you're not including actually their software in your product in the end. And uh, when it comes to GPLv3, uh, the people from Yocto actually opened a bit it. They found a nice way how to go around it. And actually it's more of a hack than an encouraged solution. So they created the meta GPLv2 layer that holds the software that was once licensed GPLv2, but now the license was switched to GPLv3. So essentially it's like old versions of certain <laughs> software components, and there's like, uh, one of my colleagues mentioned, it's a passive aggressive way, they, they tell you that this is a ticking time bomb essentially. It's really not encouraged to do these things, you should find either proper alternatives, or just use GPLv3 versions of certain software because this is not a feasible solution. But anyways, it's still available and you can still use it, so I think that's quite nice that they're actually trying to maintain it at least to a small degree. And then to summarize uh, about this, Yocto is actually quite fun when you get to know it, because with the path, with all of these things that I encountered, the first time I was trying to solve, like, for instance, the debugging solution or the testing solution, you always think about how would you manually do it, you know, oh, I'm going to write this script to that script that's going to do this, this and that, and then you realize, these people have already thought about it, and they already solved these problems for you, so there's no need to actually go around it, and then once you actually figure it out, it's really fun to actually work with Yocto. And, like mentioned before, it has also features to ease your development. And I have to say it's a bit hard to learn comparing to the other solutions that I counter with because it has its own syntax, it has its own particularities. The layered approach, which is actually really nice, but it's a, definitely a pill to swallow. And, yeah, I mean, uh, the thing is that if you in any part of this, the software stack or actually hardware that you're developing on, integrating into the Yocto projects has the benefit of you being able, being compatible with the ecosystem quite a bit. So I think it's a really, really good way, good thing to get uh, involved in. And also I'd like to encourage you to share the experience with the technology that you like as much as I like the Yocto project. And I hope that I presented it in a way that you'll be more encouraged to try out new solutions, even though in the beginning they might see there's a rocky road and you might also complain to people like I did, like why is this done in this way, you know, Build Root has it done much nicer, but then you grow up and you realize not everything is the same and you naturally have to have to deal with certain other things. So yeah, I would invite you to share your experience with the technology that you like in any way and you're free to actually, yeah, oh, we have to stop the presentation in the same way we started it for all the system defense here. And I would also invite you to ask me some questions if you want and contact me naturally. So, any questions? Uh, great presentation. Uh, so, you said you told us why you like it. Uh, mm -hmm. Can you tell us reasons what some parts that you hate about it, aside that it can be difficult to learn sometimes? Right. So, the things that are uh, sometimes not the, the best things that we learned or actually I learned from experience is 
there is a caching mechanism, meaning that when you're trying to build an image, it actually creates a cache, and it really speeds up the build times quite a lot. But sometimes, uh, the system tries to be much smarter than it actually is, which might cause you problems if you're trying to reuse already built artifacts while you're changing some kind of configuration. It doesn't happen often, but we saw that with certain components that it might happen. And then you spend hours and hours of your own time to try to get underneath something, trusting the tool completely, while sometimes you can't trust it 100%. May I say build times as well? <laughs> that's Actually, that's what I also wanted to add, build times. Uh, the build times are not the best. But leveraging the caching mechanism, then they're great if you can trust it. Yeah. <laughs> Meaning that some components, you should know which components you should not trust, and you can mark them even. So that's a good tool. When you learn which components you can't trust anymore with the caching mechanism, then you mark them, I don't trust you. <laughs> and another thing is like a, it's like a steep learning curve. Meaning if you want to learn Yocto, it's, it's going to take a bit of time, but you're always free to read the developer's manual, contact me personally as well, and uh, read about it. I think they're quite good with their documentation, honestly. I mean, it's scary when you have a 200 page like developer's manual. Ain't no one got time to read that, right? But uh, it's worth it, it's all worth it. Any more questions? One more. Yeah, great presentation. So, uh, I've used Yokito and, or currently using it, but uh, this testing you mentioned was I missed completely. Um, <laughs> so uh, really, the question is the test. You said you could run on the real hardware. Exactly. Is I mean, is the resource requirement for running the tests on par with the end application, or is this is it the same issue when you try to add all the debug symbols to the platform? Mm -hmm. So it requires instrumentation, actually, but as far as I remember with the test image, you have to instrument the bootloader and have a separate SD card mounted inside it that is always, that you're always able to actually put the flash image and then switch between two partitions, in a way. So it, there is an implication that you would need an extra resource inside of your real hardware, so that's true. But in the end, if you make it work, which honestly we only, uh, I only managed to make it work on a, on a virtualized target, and we are trying now to do it with the proper hardware, it still needs instrumentation, meaning that you have to handle the power, the power controller right, you have to control the switching of the, of the actual, uh, uh, like, yeah, the partitions you're going to use and so on. So it's not as easy as it is with the virtual target, but it's still the, the, the workflow, how to do it, is present there. And it also tells you how, to, with your own application, how to create the test suite and run it with Yocto, which is, I think, really good for regression testing. Thanks. Hello. Do you have uh, support for just-in-time debugging or uh, breaking points in the editor? Uh, in the editor, for instance? Uh, well, since, as far as I know, well, since Yocto is a build system, then usually what you would do is, hmm, I guess then you would have to manually then take the actual symbols and load them inside of the editor, I guess, and then you would be able to run the GDB through the editor, and then you would be able to step through and so on. So it's, it depends on the editor that you're using and the tooling, but basically by using the concept that's written here, and following those guidelines, you would still be able to do it. So meaning you would have the debug root file system and you would load it inside of the GDB that's inside of your editor, hooking to the target and then actually launching the process, you would be able to step debug and go through pretty much any application then. So I think Qt Creator does that for instance, uh, mm -hmm. if you define a kit and then point at the debug symbols. But what it does is set up as an SSH session and launch your process on the target, but it does it for you so you, you don't have to think about all the details. Mm -hmm. Do we have more questions? Ah, I think we have some in the front as well. Uh, you had uh, on uh, the image feature slide uh, mm -hmm. profiling. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you have used that and um, which tool you would recommend for profiling. So we used uh, Volgrind and it was also the same project when we used the debug root file system. So we used Volgrind quite extensively there because initially it gave us more information just 
uh, more than just GDP when we didn't have any information on the target. And also like naturally for checking for memory leaks. Hmm. Anyone else? Everyone's happy. Thank you. Thanks everyone for watching.